Welcome to Let's Be Nerds. I'm your host, Stephen Jay, and today I'm joined by my fantastic co-hosts, Gordon and Lizette. How are you guys doing? Oh, I'm doing great, Steve. How are you? Fantastic. Couldn't be better. Lizette? I am trying to stay awake, but I am good. These late night recordings will do that to you. Yep. So we have an interesting subject and we have an interesting guest today. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, Lizette, our cousin Dylan's joining us. Dylan, yep. how are you? I'm great. Two five-hour energies and a bang, and I'm wide awake. <laughs> hey, you got to do what you got to do, and oh, we yeah. appreciate we appreciate you uh, being up for this recording. And we're glad to finally connect with you and have you on an episode. Happy to finally be here. I always <laughs> hear about it, so I'm glad I finally got a chance to do it. But Absolutely. Hey, you beat your sister on here, so there's that. Well, she's asleep right now. <laughs> <laughs> Not that surprised. whole res- responsible thing. Right. responsible in times like these. Right? When we're, we have to talk about our favorite supervillains, and she's just sawing logs. I, I can't relate. <laughs> she can only talk about herself, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> she is kind of the supervillain of the Discord chat. A little bit. <laughs> She's always stirring up something. <laughs> she she might have figured this was about her. Anyway, so this is a pretty cool topic. I like the idea that this is kind of going to be, it's going to be an episode in, I'm not sure if we're going to be having this one in October or not, but I like it because it's fitting for this time, when, even if it's just when we're recording it with it being Halloween. Everybody loves a creepy villain, a badass villain, whatever you want to call it. It's kind of Halloween-ish, but maybe that's a stretch, and I'm just trying to make it work to make myself feel better. So (laughs) with that being said, we're going to go around, and everybody's going to list some of their favorite villains, villain teams, types of villains, and uh, we're going to discuss and see where we go. So, Lizette, why don't you kick us off and tell us who your favorite baddies are? Alrighty, so when I was trying to come up with who I wanted to talk about today, I started to notice a trend about a lot of my favorite villains. Um, Most of the villains that I really, really like have a tendency to eventually turn into anti-heroes. So um, my favorite, one of my absolute favorite supervillains is Loki. So he is definitely leaning more into the side of anti-hero these days in the MCU. Um, But he's been my favorite since that first Thor movie came out back in, was that 2011? I believe that sounds right. Yeah. Um, And then as for other villains in general... I have to say one of my favorite villains for like a very long time has always been Maleficent over in the Disney universe. Um, And if you guys have watched any of the live action Maleficent movies with Angelina Jolie, they also turned her into more of an anti-hero. Not sure how you guys feel about those movies, but I enjoyed them. I thought it was an interesting take on the character. So... um, yeah, I guess. Not, oh, go on. No, I was just going to say, I am familiar with the first one. I have not seen the second. The second one was kind of meh, if I'm honest. I was just like, e, they, it, it felt like they um, slid backwards on some character growth. So mm-hmm. not my favorite. Yeah, not my favorite. But the first one I did really, really enjoy. Um, but no, I, I guess my favorite villains are the ones that I can understand their motives even if i don't necessarily agree with them i can see how they got to their conclusions so like if we're talking about loki in the mcu when he started out in that first thor movie 
he was really just being more mischievous and he just wanted more attention from his parents and that's when he uncovered like the big secret that he was actually a frost giant and it just kind of broke him Don't spoil it. Uh, the movie is older than you gordon <laughs> that's a lie if you have not seen the like that movie, why are you listening to this pod? Like, no, just with peace and love. Why are you listening to this podcast, you know, with man? With all the disrespect. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, but yeah, so like dark. his whole <laughs> his whole super villain thing kind of came more out of a place of being broken and misunderstood. So like, I understand that whole kind of descent into madness, and I I really liked his redemption arc in like the third Thor movie. I guess it kind of started in the second one a little bit. Um, And then going into the Loki TV show where he is definitely much more firmly placed in that anti-hero role. As far as Maleficent goes, I enjoyed her in the original Sleeping Beauty where she was just a bad bitch just because she could be. Um, But can I ask you, uh, with Sleeping Beauty, it's been mm-hmm. so long since I've seen it. In my memory, I don't remember her. I remember the spindle scene. Uh-huh. And I remember the end when she, you know, the incredible transformation into the dragon and the thorn yeah. bushes. But, like, was she actually really that heavily throughout that film? No, in all honesty, she wasn't. I just okay. really liked her character. <laughs> yeah. And just she- the whole, the fact that she was evil just because she could be Mm -hmm. i Um, really fell in love with her in kingdom hearts of course yeah kingdom hearts definitely gives her more backstory um and just they flesh out her character that that version of her character a lot more um because in i mean in all honesty in the original sleeping beauty movie she she feels like she has more dimension than some of the other characters, but like actually sitting here and thinking about it, they didn't develop her as much as they could have. But that movie also came out in, in I don't know, hold on, I, I want to know what year that came out in now. I want to say it was like, oh. I'm talking about the original. Came out in 1959. Oh, God. So, looking. I think it's older than all of us. Um, I don't know about you. So look, let's not start that. Um, <laughs> Stevens and my birthdays are coming up soon. We don't need to talk about that. I was going to say, yeah, let's I not like do the age guy. shaming. <laughs> I like that um, guy. <laughs> Yeah, Gordon, it's it's the first person that's come on the podcast and not picked on you besides Bob. So, of course, you like him. <laughs> well, I don't know him well enough. It takes me like a couple of uh, meet and greets before I start bullying people. Give Sweet. me five minutes. You don't need that any longer than that. <laughs> I promise. We, uh, we support cyberbullying in this podcast, but only towards Gordon. Uh, you, you'll, character. you'll get the drift. Yeah, kids are being <laughs> wimps these days or whatever. Uh, right. But anyway, back on topic. In a week. Look, you be quiet. I don't even know which one that was to. <laughs> was that to Gordon or Dylan? <laughs> it, was to, it was to Gordon because yes. he's over there. He's over there talking about his age because his birthday falls right smack in the middle between yours and mine. He's, oh, isn't Gordon like, like seven? I was just gonna say Gordon Seven. I am Gordon. turning twenty in less than a week. Okay, well, to those two, that's like you're seven. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, what are they turning thirty this week, right, guys? I wish. I thought it was forty, but I could be wrong. Oh, okay. All right, so it's equal yeah. opportunity bullying now. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I like this guy. Wait, see- was that your? Wait, how old are you turning, if you don't mind me? We're the same year. <laughs> no, well, you're, no we, we've, we've, I'm, we've had this conversation on this podcast before. Yeah. You're I'm, younger than me. Yeah, I'm a year, I'm one year and eight days younger than you. Okay. All right. For some reason, I, I remembered that we were eight days apart, but I didn't, I couldn't, I can never remember if you're a year older or a year younger. Yeah. 
28 but, sucks just a heads up <laughs> I, know, just I, don't, I don't i just got used to saying i'm 27 i realized i was thinking about that earlier today i'm like i just got used to saying i'm 27 and i'm about to turn 28 i'm like what is this i've spent the entire last year telling people i was 29 and i'm turning 29 and i'm like just get, just get me to 30 so i have a round number with a zero i, I can't take it anymore i mean at this point a comfortable I, number Mm-hmm. Yeah, at this point, I feel like between Dylan, Delaney, and Gabrielle, they're going to have me convinced and calling myself 30. Starting, You did say that one time. I know I did. <laughs> and I'm just like, you know what? It's fine. We're close enough. We're just going to, yeah. But anyway. It's not like free coffee or something. Anyway, I'm sorry. <laughs> what were you saying? Um. I lost my train of thought. It was just so oh. I, I I like the way that they so I, I was saying I liked her original character characterization in the Sleeping Beauty movie how she was just evil, but I also really liked the spin that they did in the Maleficent movie where they actually gave her backstory and it was more once again that misunderstood person who was very hurt and is just trying to protect themselves and who they love by attacking anybody that gets close Mm -hmm. um i really liked the dynamic that they gave her between her and aurora because originally um so i don't i don't know if you guys have done any research into the the way that the original story went i came across a post on pinterest that i think was from tumblr at some point that put it into perspective why in the original movie, why Maleficent was so insulted that she was not invited and invited to the birthday party for Aurora. And it was something, man, now I wish I had it pulled up so I could read it to you guys. Um, It was something about the way that invitations worked during that time period for her to be the only one who was excluded from the invitations was actually a severe insult. And according to, like, the time period that the movie was set in, her cursing the princess was not entirely out of left field. Like, it was considered that big of an insult, them not inviting her. I think there was more to it than that. I'm not remembering the details. Mm -hmm. But it was just, like, it was an interesting, like, okay, like, there's a reason behind this. It makes more sense. Yeah. And just like showing up and scaring And just being like, yeah, you know, baby, you're dead. Mm -hmm. Uh, Or you're going to be dead when you turn 16. Um, In the Maleficent movie, I really liked the additional motivation of her having been friends and eventually lovers with um, King Stefan. And all of the scenes that led up to like what he did to her... um, and how she just hated him and that's why she went and cursed the child it wasn't anything against the child and that's why all right gordon i'm gonna do this just for you spoiler alert if you haven't seen it um at the end of the movie when they need true love's kiss to wake up aurora in the maleficent movie it is actually maleficent with the true love of a mother who wakes her up nobody else is able to do it and I found that to be a very neat and just kind of beautiful twist on it, especially for Disney, because Disney tends to focus so much on romantic love Mm -hmm. and to a lot of their movies and stuff that they've been doing more recently has expanded and have been showing more family love and love of friendship, stuff like that. So it's been a nice change from just like, the prince meets her prince and everything gets better. Yeah, damsel in distress prince that was like not even in the movie but then shows up halfway through the movie to fight the villain to save the girl. Like Yeah. yeah. And the fact that in that Maleficent movie they actually kind of made fun of that because mm-hmm. they did have Prince Philip kiss her because they're like, you know, maybe this will work because they met and they really liked each other but they had literally just met so how could it be true love because they didn't know each other? And it, I don't know, it was just, it was something refreshing. It was a nice refreshing take, but Mm -hmm. I also still like the villainous version of her. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, I I guess that's all I have for you guys today on that. It does make you wonder, like, do anti-heroes make the best villains? Because, like, I'm just sitting here thinking, 
you know, you can consider so many people characters, I should say, that are like, you know, Deadpool could be considered an anti-hero. I mean, when he started out, he was very villainous and he was like part of the X, well, not X-Men, he was part of X-Force with Cable. Like, he's had a whole like undergoing of like, because he's so violent and does things, you know, not by the book, that he could be considered an anti-hero. Yeah. Um, you look at Selena Kyle from the Batman series, she's probably one of the first that come to mind on a female end of it. You know, she was a Catwoman, mean, evil, like robbing everybody, falls in love with Batman, and then you start to slowly see her like helping out, you know, taking down this person with them, and then, you know, she'll still probably steal something out of the cookie jar, but she's like playing both sides of the fence. Makes you wonder, like, do they, does that villain trope make the best villain? I feel like it when they take the characters down that road and kind of make them either if they start as an anti-hero or they kind of develop that way. I I think at least in in the examples that I'm thinking of at the moment, it's because they put more development into their characters rather than just leaving them as a flat bad guy. The more they develop their characters and give them reasons for doing the bad things that they do, it tends to make them more sympathetic to people, at which point it's like, okay, if they actually had a good reason for this, then what's to keep them from kind of swinging back the other way and doing some good stuff for reasons that, whatever reasons they may have, whether it's a good reason or not. Yeah. And it just shows, like, those characters become more dynamic, and I feel like it makes them more realistic, because if you think about it, like, I don't think any person is ever, like, purely good or purely evil. I mean, like, there are exceptions to that, but in general, we all have the capacity to do both, so it makes sense if you want to write a good, compelling character, you have to give them the capacity to do both and give them the opportunity to choose and when you see one who chooses options from both sides from time to time i don't know it just it feels more relatable i agree 100 percent. i i find it to be a lot easier to kind of put yourself in their viewpoint so you can go along with them in their own story so you're not just so one-sided on the yeah. Like just just a few redeeming qualities in a villain makes them so it's more satisfying to watch them that way than just seeing someone straight up evil in my opinion. Yeah, because you can kind of get like an understanding of their headspace or even if what they're doing is terrible, you kind of can see maybe what their motivation is or why they're doing it. You can makes... see what drove them to that point to feel the need to take it that far. I agree. That's actually a pretty good segue into the villain and like I, I, by association, his team that I was going to, that I picked. Um, if you are familiar with, and I love the X-Men movies, but I'm by default X-Men comic books and animated series because they were very closely adapted to the comic books. But for me, my favorite supervillain has to be Magneto um, from the X-Men he, in my time, and I'm sure they were so much retconning and, re, you know, stories have changed over the years. But I always know him as Eric Lencher. Apparently his name now is Max Eisenhard and Eric Lencher was a pseudo or a fake name. I don't remember. Like, oh, don't I remember didn't know. I've, always, I've always known him as Eric. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah, I, was I, doing, always, I was doing research for this tonight and I uh, was Googling. Or on, I'm sorry, I was on Wikipedia, and um, I was like just going down through the basic information, and I kind of was skipping it because I'm like, well, I know his powers, I know like his basics, so I wanted to get to some more details. I scroll past the alias, and I'm like, wait a minute, and so I had to fall down this rabbit hole, and it doesn't really make sense. But so, in the beginning of the X Men, you really just see him as the the big bad guy with the super crazy powers, and that's it, and when the comic books evolve, they start to explain, you know, well, first you realize that him and Professor X were friends. So then that makes you more intrigued. And then they break down the whole World War II situation. And like, 
when you are actually watching those panels of, or sorry, reading those panels and you're seeing that he was in Warsaw and he was in Auschwitz and his parents and his sister were killed and buried in, one, in the mass graves, like it took on a part of history that is so traumatizing for anybody that would have lived through it, anybody that, you know, the descendants of people that have lived through it. So for me, it like, it humanized him in a sense, because I couldn't imagine obviously what that would feel like. And then throughout his, after surviving throughout his time, he just keeps experiencing whether it's anti-Semitism or I guess anti-mutant rhetoric. And whenever he eventually meets up with professor Xavier, they were both working at a psychiatric hospital in Israel and they were confronted with a person that I believe at the time was maybe a villain, but I think what the person later on became a, a villain in the modern day comic books, but it caused them to reveal their powers to each other. And like, this is on the heels of them having like very serious debates about life and the, like the perspective of like all power and, you know, what is the moral thing to do in a position of power? And so then they find out that they're both mutants and they realize that their ideologies are so completely misaligned that they part ways. And it's only until like Magneto's, I believe he steals a lot of gold from the Nazis that had taken it from people that they had imprisoned, specifically, I believe, Jewish people. And Magneto basically takes it back with much to the advantage of his mutant abilities. And that's what kind of funds his operations. And he takes the exact diametric opposite of Charles Xavier. And he's, you know, he refers to mutants as the, instead of homo sapiens, they're homo superiors. And he truly falls, like, he went from being somebody that was persecuted by because of his religion, and because of his genetic mutations, to then becoming the persecutor by basically saying that, normal everyday humans were less than and they didn't have a spot at the table anymore and they needed to be eradicated and so it's it's an interesting dynamic and that's what i love about the x-men's x-men's comic books is they really tackled a lot of like the racial identity and, and things that we talk about now they were doing in the 80s and the 90s and everything that they everything that the mutants deal with could be related to some form of a group that has had to have uh, endured a hardship. And the best part is, is Magneto's character. He builds this whole team, like the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants with his, and we got to get this, you know, in the MCU, they got to get this right. Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch are Magneto's son and daughter. And so is Polaris. And they need to make that happen in the movies. If the X-Men are coming in, that's my one great, but he has this whole like team of heroes and at first they're kind of ragtag and then mystique comes in and she like forms a brotherhood where she's kind of managing it. And he's like the overseer. Of course, everybody knows mystique from the movies. The Jennifer Lawrence of it all was not the greatest. I, I don't like what they did with her backstory because her actual backstory is a lot more interesting. She went through a lot of similar stuff that Magneto did, which was what drew them to each other. And her child being Rogue, her child being Nightcrawler, adds a lot of the same dimension that Magneto went through with Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver. You know, my children are now in this world that hates us for simply being who we are. So again, and this adds to your point, Lizette, I'm going to beat them to the punch. I'm going to be evil. I'm going to show my teeth. I'm going to fight back before the fight's at my door. Yeah. And I, and I guess I understand that. And then Magneto kind of went anti-hero. At one point, Professor Xavier was missing or dead or whatever. And Magneto ran the X-Men in a time period trying to find him. So he's kind of had that flip-flop where you can understand, like, I would never personally agree. I would be more in line with Xavier's ideologies. But I see from the story writing and the dialogue and the character development I, I understand why someone would take that path, especially if you had the power that he does. Well, well, I also find uh, Xavier and Magneto's relationship as a good viewpoint of Xavier is someone who has went through terrible things as well, or seen terrible things, and has kept that same faith, while Magneto shows a man who's been beaten to the ground and just 
can't see. Mm -hmm. it, it's um, that what's that expression? There's nothing more dangerous than a man with nothing left to lose. Exactly. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I think Magneto is a personification of that. And then on the flip side, what they started to do with Xavier that I liked is they started to show anti-hero traits, like what he did with Jean Grey with like suppressing her actual powers because of the in inevitable Dark Phoenix moment. They started to show me more humanity in him. He's not the perfect hero or anything like that. They showed his mistakes and his regrets. Exactly. And I think that they started to do that after they started to add humanitarian humanity humanity excuse me to magneto <laughs> i just I, I don't know i love how those books were written I, I think that it's if i had to like recommend one time period and comic book series to anyone it would probably be that era because i think that there are a lot of moral lessons that you can actually learn from the writing and the storytelling there and it sounds like they took a lot of care to be respectful of their subject matter while still trying to remain true to it mm -hmm. which is something that we don't have very much of in our current um how do i want to phrase this i know the, the current world of entertainment is tending to shy away from exploring those more difficult subjects that we need to be aware of we need to be reminded of so the fact that they were able to weave in those historical events that are still very relevant today mm -hmm. it it just it makes not only for a good story but um good lessons you can learn from it exactly and i would not give you a nickel for any of the comic books today and, I'm, <laughs> and that's yeah. that's where i'm gonna I'm sure, you, I'm sure you guys have seen some of the recent headlines because they've been everywhere. And it's there's one way to handle history and current events in comic books, and then there's another way to... Um, Try to make the most bang for your buck. Mm -hmm, and jump on a train of uh, public support and what sounds good in the moment. Yeah, modern modern day comic books I could uh, give you a shit about. But that's a, that's probably an episode for you know, another day, because I don't want to get on a political rant. Yeah, we'll save that one. <laughs> Still trying to get monetized here. <laughs> Any, anyway, with that being said, I think this is the perfect time to take a quick break. Um, and we will, we're going to hear from our one and only lovely sponsor, Anchor, and we will be right back and finish out the last of our favorite villains. Hey there, guys and gals. I hope you are enjoying this episode of the Speak Easily podcast. I know I had a lot of fun recording it. Speaking of, have you ever thought about making your own podcast? It's always been something I wanted to do, but I kept putting it off because I could never find the right platform to host it. That is, until I discovered Anchor. Anchor is an all-in-one recording, editing, and hosting app that makes the process simple. And the best part is it's totally free. And I mean, genuinely free. And if you're someone like me who has a love-hate relationship with editing audio, let me tell you this, I was blown away by how user-friendly the in-app editing tool actually is. My favorite part, I must admit, is the distribution. Normally with new podcasts, you have to submit your show to various platforms individually, which can be time consuming and very frustrating. But with Anchor, they do the legwork for you. They'll submit it to Spotify, Apple, CastBox, Google, and several others with just the click of a button. Plus, unlike other platforms, there is no minimum requirement for listeners. So you can monetize your podcast and start earning right away. So, Download the free Anchor app available in the App Store or on the Google Play Store, or do what I did and head over to anchor.fm to get started today. Thank you, Anchor, for sponsoring this podcast. I guess this means the next round's on you. I'll drink to that. And we're back. Okay, so Gordon, you're uh, next on the order list of the favorite villain. What do you got for us? Well, you... uh bring up marvel my 
one of my favorite villains is honestly there are too many to choose from but one of my favorite is dr doom also in the marvel universe and he, he goes by many names uh one, his main alias, or alter ego, is Victor Von Doom. And some of his more notable aliases are King Boss, Doombot, Infamous Iron Man, God, Emperor Doom, and something I just can't pronounce, so I'm not even going to try. Can you drop it in chat so I can see it? I will. Give me 30, just give me a second to find out how to copy and paste again. One. There you go, one second, like I told you. Um, I'm a fan of Doctor Doom for his his just the the way he's per, has been portrayed in comics, and the very little we have got to see him in their Fantastic Four movie. Very which, poor attempts at him. Yes, yes, I, I can agree with that. But I I would love to see when they bring um the X-Men and, you know, Fantastic Four and all that into the cinematic Marvel Universe and make it all fit together in stage four, like I hope they're going to do, that they make him the villain for uh, stage four, maybe stage five of the cinematic universe for Marvel. I think that'd be pretty cool, you know, because they can do it right. I, mm-hmm. I believe that they could do it right. Because they actually have the budget and they actually care. Well, they have the budget. I wouldn't say that they all care. That's true. <laughs> no, but you I think at least... Care. Saying Marvel I... cares is like saying Disney cares, and we all know Disney doesn't give a fuck. I know, still fuck with us. And that's true, but they do care about getting their money, and so they kind of have to care at least a little bit about what their audience cares about. So... And, you could kind and, of say they care. Unlike Aquaman 2. <laughs> <laughs> We're not starting. Oh, We're not sorry, starting sorry. that. that the, I had something stuck in my throat. I just had to get it out. My bad. Our podcast <laughs> repeats our same gripes over and over. And it's okay because that's how you affect change. Yes, until we are heard, we will make our grievances known. We just send these episodes to like some form of an executive. Um, we'll just set up an automatic email. Sends the same email every day at the same time. They will notice. By this time next year, it'll be like, "Hey Jim, it's me, Steve. Another episode of me bitching about your." Uh, your lack of lack Made of quality special just for you. Lack of, lack of light in your movies. Lack Shout of originality. <laughs> um, you didn't just... copy Marvel at this point. You should have just, you know, done your own thing. But it's too there's, late for that now. There's so many movies that lack originality anymore. All of them. But that's a long topic. Did you discuss that with Drew before coming on this podcast? Because <laughs> he went on a whole tangent with us that was pretty epic. Look, that was a long one. It's been a while since me and Drew has had time to talk about anything, so <laughs> we'll talk about tangents. <laughs> My ultimate goal is to have you and him work it out schedule-wise that you can both be on at once. And just have it be. Do you remember in Family Guy, if you ever watched when Peter got that news segment, like what grinds my gears? <laughs> I would just like Drew and Dylan to have that segment in this podcast and just rant. <laughs> Let us I talk would... about any of the Batman movies or who would win, Sora or Link. Oh, God. Oh, I don't I even know if I have. One. I don't know if I even have an answer for that one. I haven't played any of the games. Time for it. That's what you don't, don't have. have. I don't. This is the whole sidebar I was not expecting. I need time to do research and development. I need to get statistics. Huh. That is like almost a four-year long argument between the two of us. Well, we maybe have... we can bring it to an end and monetize it. <laughs> we have... Bring it to the end with money. <laughs> that you won't see any of. Wow, boy. Hey, I'm just happy to be here. That, that was so right. ignorant. That was... <laughs> we're gonna cut it. We're gonna bleep it out. No, we're not. No, we're not. Just because... one long <laughs> technical <laughs> difficulties. Um, God. you know that other podcast that we don't like, and one of the oh, things we yeah. don't like about them is that they talk about money all the time. We just did that on an episode. <laughs> well, that's not all the time, though. We don't say that our CPM after two hundred episodes is only twenty dollars. <laughs> We Listen. don't sound like we're recording in a train car going through the Trans Am. Listen, they record, they record. I can on... change that for you if you like. 
<laughs> I just gotta move a fan around. around. No, this, this is... I can get some banjo music going. <laughs> no, you'd have to. You have to get on like a New York subway. That's that's their thing, and it's like they're recording on a. <laughs> they have their toaster plugged into a public outlet. And they're recording on their toaster. Well, see, my toaster and... gives me Wi-Fi, so this works. <laughs> Oh, so maybe and it's not out of the realm of possibility that they are actually <laughs> recording on a toaster. That is true. And their meme format is like Stop, stop, stop. That's too, that's too specific. They're going to know we're talking about them. Stop. Like they listen to our episodes. And they, they probably do. You anyway, never know. I mean, yeah, they need tips on how to do a better podcast. Okay, Gordon. <laughs> okay, back to Victor Von, Von Doom, Doom. And yeah. uh, Dr. Doom. Doctor Doom. Um, pro- probably one of the most powerful versions of Doctor Doom is God Emperor Doom, with the power of the Beyonders and other heroes during the Secret War storyline. Doctor Doom stole the power from the Beyonders and became God Emperor Doom. I uh, know jack shit about the Beyonders because I'm definitely reading most of this off a of wiki article because I didn't have time to make proper notes because I'm lazy and procrastinate. But the Beyonders That's are, an inside uh, thought. We'll get along yeah. great. <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry. Did that come out? Sorry, my bad. We're, so we're the, gonna, the Beyonders we're I made a list like as we were talking just now. <laughs> so to segue a little bit, the, the Beyonders uh, are a extra-dimensional entities powerful enough to collect planets and powerful enough to kill... Just a second. Let, let me find the right word before I just start blurting out random BS like I like to do. Um, Say it with confidence and they'll believe you. No, they won't. That's not how this works. They don't listen to a thing I say. <laughs> that I is true. Realized it. Yeah, at least he's honest. <clears throat> when you accept it, it's okay. So, I'll come... Uh, well, they are... Um, Extremely powerful extra-dimensional creatures or beings, uh, but they do not have the power to travel back or forth in time. They're almost a linear entity that moves along with the current universe, so to speak. So they can't affect stuff in the past or the future, only the present. Hmm. But Doctor Doom has been noted saying that they are not too hard now he says they're not too hard to kill as in it only takes a couple universes worth of energy to kill one of them or planets worth either way that's not a lot apparently in the realm of that's someone why we have a multiverse exactly <laughs> so we can just throw universes at the people who can pretty much dictate how the uh, future turns out um, God, the Celestials, they're, they're, they're the ones that they can kill with pretty much a snap of their fingers without breaking a sweat. You guys do know who the Celestials are, right? Yes. Yeah, the ones that just, you know, do everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they can kill them, like, snap. There. Like, that's how much power they have. They can kill them, and it's like, they didn't even break a sweat, it's just playing cornhole on a beach in Cabo. God, just another Saturday <laughs> night. Oh my God, he's trying to be funny now. <laughs> uh, I, I am funny in my own head. And as long as I'm laughing, that's all that matters. As long um, as one person's laughing, even if it's yourself, you carry on. Exactly. <laughs> Steven, why, back... why is it that everybody I bring on to this podcast gets along with gordon and then they eventually turn on us um liza you have have to remember i've never been on your side i've always been on my own and i just bring (laughs) other people with me and you know this to be true yes i do i'm on everyone's side (laughs) whether that's a good thing or a bad thing i don't know (laughs) (laughs) so some of dr doom's yes Regular Doctor Doom's abilities are genius level intellect, a mastery of most forms of magic, mind transference, and technopathy, expert in hand to hand combat, martial, martial arts, and swordsmanship, 
uh, peak human conditioning, an indomitable will. His armor grants him superhuman strength and durability. His gauntlets can fire laser and force blasts. He can has flight via rocket boots. He can generate force fields. He has a various other high-tech weapons and gizmos and gadgets. He has dimensional travel and probably the best thing on this list for abilities. He has diplomatic immunity. <laughs> he was the leader of a sovereign nation. Is he? Yes, he was. And so he has diplomatic immunity. And he um has been affiliated with quite a diff- uh, few groups. So he he's almost an anti-villain himself as he has teamed up with the, the Avengers, the Guardians of the Galaxy, the Sorcerer Supreme, another team I don't know anything about and I'm not going to say. A third thing I don't know anything about, but I think it's uh, in- Intellectual... Nope, not going to try. Uh, the Astonishing Intellectual? Avengers. Probably. Um, Lethal Legion. J- just a couple of his um, team affiliations. The Lethal Legion. I love the alliteration. They were... They were uh creative with that one Mm -hmm. (laughs) yes the lethal legion um grim reapers lethal legion um consisted of eight man power man living laser and swordsman those sound stellar (laughs) eight man attacks captain america but is beaten back by the avengers however he captures black panther's girlfriend Monica binding her hand and foot with metal clamps. Black Panther is lured to, into Eight Man's trap despite getting past him. He is knocked out by an exploding dummy of Monica. Um, oh, Black Panther is chained with Eight Man, or is chained, in, and with Eight Man, he meets the other members of the Lethal Legion. You had me at dummy. <laughs> yeah, yes. what about me? Exploding dummy at the. Monica Lewinsky exploding dummy. Yeah, I was lost. No, oh, you got my attention with that one. <laughs> um, Doctor Doom's first appearance is in Fantastic Four issue number five in July, nineteen sixty-two. For you to remember when that came out. Um, <laughs> don't even dignify him with a response. <laughs> Uh, it just gives me more. They're power. a little too old to remember that, actually. Yeah. Foggy. Oh, oh, my bad, my bad. Um, oh, in yes. King Thor's timeline, Doom acquire, acquired sorry the powers of Iron Fist, Ghost Rider, Starbrand, and Doctor Strange. He wanted to destroy the new mortals that appeared in a desolate Earth, but he got attacked by King Thor and Old Man Phoenix during the battle. He killed Logan, which allowed the Phoenix Force to go. To Thor before Doom was about to use the Phantom Stare, stare to um, to Thor. Uh, Thor, will not, oh, with the power of the Phoenix Force, was able to defeat Doom. <clears throat> I got a quick, quick, just a quick question. I got to ask. Yes, I'm reading this straight from the Wikipedia. I was say, why is the last segment of our podcast always you just reading us Wikipedia pages? <laughs> well, I'm reading right along with him. If that helps any. So yeah, and he also he's also in the Venom verse. Doom was consumed by the poison, and becomes the second uh, in command after Poison Thanos. He, with other Poison heroes, started battling the army of Venoms, in which he was the only survivor. And then the Poisons tried to invade Earth six one six. He and Thanos, along with the other Poisons, got killed after the Poison Queen was destroyed. You said poison about six times. I need a dollar. I am broke right now, so you're going to have to wait till payday. Sorry. I'm a patient man. I'm not. <laughs> um, so we have Earth-111. In this reality, visited by Ben Grimm, who, while attempting to recover the coordinates of the ultimate nullifier, divided between the subconscious minds of four alternate Johnny Storms, Doom was the leader of the Challengers of Doom, consisting of himself, Reed Richards, Sue Storm, and the Hulk. With Le- Le- Levert, 
the virtue sound it out La- um, La- La- having been destroyed in an unspecific past disaster and doom relocating to new york to become a hero when galactus came to earth and landed in russia doom dismissed it as a hoax promoting grim to note that doom was more arrogant than the version he knew as the doom of earth 66 was at least willing to listen to even his enemies if the situation was serious enough, rather than dismiss their views automatically as irrelevant. So, speaking of dismissing views and irrelevancy, um, thank you for reading your Wikipedia page. Is that a good place so, to uh, uh, get back to man, actual old, conversations? Old Man Logan in the alternate Wolverine-centric <laughs> feature, where the supervillains of the Marvel Universe finally won and divided America amongst themselves... Doom has his own area of land called New something I can't pronounce. He is, this is a really fun audio book. Only a few panels <laughs> dressed in all gray, sitting atop a cliff watching a now old Logan and Hawkeye driving the spider buggy built by the human torch. It is believed such that a weird comic series. Clyde Wenchman Wenchham has taken on the role of Doom. Uh, this Earth X in the dystopian future of Earth X, Doctor Doom has killed the Invisible Woman and the Human Torch, but dies in the process. Reed Richard took his place as the ruler of the word I can't pronounce, and also wears his armor. Latveria, new Latveria. It you, sounds Latveria. like latrine. <laughs> like if I did not have my glasses on, I'd be like, oh, he's he's the king of latrine. Okay, <laughs> makes sense. Makes sense. There's so many more. No, there's not. No. Nope. Oh, um, there is though. We're just so, going to delete the Wikipedia page now. <laughs> I won't update on my thing. It's okay. I turned the internet off. Okay. So anyway, Doctor Doom definitely adds a lot to the table as far as a villain. I like the antagonistic relationship he has with the Fantastic Four. Wasn't there a storyline that he was like you know secretly in love with Sue Richards at one point? There's probably a storyline where he was secretly in love with all of them. Probably that is true. at the same time. Absolutely. That's why he's so angry. <laughs> um, um, so what what's you guys' views on Vandal Savage? Oh, uh, Vandal Savage is a very interesting villain. He's I a man like looking him. to have a good time because he's been alive for way too long. Yeah. Um, Again, good reason like to be Hawk angry. Man and Hawk Woman. I don't think I know who you're talking about, so I'm going to so, pull up. That was a weird kind of plot and story they did with those three characters. I liked it, though. I, 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 I enjoyed it. It was a good little twist. For those of you listening, Gordon just transitioned over to Vandal Savage, who's a DC Comics villain who essentially is immortal. And he got hit by Space Rock and no die now. And no, he only no die if he keeps killing these same two people that also got hit by Space Rock. And no death now as long as people keep dying. It, it's... And, and he only gets to keep living as long as they remember who they were in their past or the power doesn't transfer to him so he can keep not dying. Yeah, it's really convoluted, and I don't think I would be able to put that much effort in for years to be stuck here, in all honesty. I wouldn't want to be stuck here for that long. I mean, honestly. Come on, who wants to be on Earth that long? Not me. <laughs> I'll, I'm getting on the getting... first rocket to Mars. I hope another space rock hits me. That's what I'm hoping for. <laughs> the first one didn't do it. The second one has to finish the job. <laughs> <laughs> What's the chances of two space rocks hitting me? You've been actually hit by a space rock, or are you doing a punchline? Uh, we have punch. Oh, yeah, there, you just I have to get in line for it. <sighs> okay, I couldn't find the punchline. Well, there's no punchline, so. <laughs> <laughs> Look, so I haven't about... done any puns yet. This is good. It's development. So, so Dylan, how, what's your view on Bane? Bane, um, I loved him in the movies. I'm hey, kind of so it. so with him in the comics just because little man wants to be big man and still has <laughs> little man anger problems. Now, when you say movies, are you talking about the live action Batman movies or the, the uh, Chris... movies? Yes, the live action Batman movies. The good ones, the only ones worth talking about. 
You don't mean Batman no, they're and Robin? Not. <laughs> so, okay, look, those three right there is the best we're going to get, and you really can't complain about it. I don't know. I want oh, Batman yeah. and Robin with the nipple suits back. First <laughs> off, I still have nightmares about that. It's like they watching so two, they can cut two narwhals try to fight out of someone's shirt. It's not fun. <laughs> <laughs> but... It's- Entertaining to watch though, like to go back and to see, like, who thought two narwhals that, trying to fight out of a shirt? <laughs> who thought Arnold, that some of that was good ideas? To put Arnold on- Schwarzenegger is Mr. Freeze. Are you kidding me? I was gonna bring that up, that's my favorite part. Like, <laughs> what casting director, like, uh, they saw Arnold and said, nice. Him, he will bring us money, and they weren't wrong. <laughs> the only the reason you up. go back to watch that show or movie is for his ice puns. <laughs> and him just being himself the entire time. <laughs> Not even a new character. It's no. just him. It's just him dressed up like Frosty the fucking snowman. Tell me the last time you saw him play a character that wasn't just him. Uh, well, what do you mean? His original acting in Kindergarten Cop didn't do it for you? You want to talk about Cody and the Barbarian? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, pain, pain. I have some more honorable mentions. Um... Uh, Deathstroke, I, I like him a lot. I think he's a really good villain. Dead Slade Wilson. Wilson. Yeah. yeah. But Slade Wilson is a good character, but he was definitely a total knockoff. I liked him a lot in the Arrow show, to be honest. Yes, I was going to say that. That storyline for him is one of my favorites. The Arrow storyline in general is just an amazing like, The storyline. first three seasons and then the 20 after that, I kind of got lost. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, all EC shows have done that. I'm like, oh, the first two seasons are good, and then I just stopped watching <laughs> because I don't want to watch the same thing over and over again with a different set of characters. Yeah, that's why I stopped watching Supergirl because it didn't even so start repetitive. that. That couldn't don't. even couldn't even get a I shot. I, yeah, I think I made it halfway through the first episode, and I was like, this is not well, for me. That I saw the effects so in that, and I'm just like, well, they gave up on that show. Carry on. It was they a whole political it. agenda. Like, yeah, they just wanted it for woman superhero. Oh, of course. And they were like, Supergirl would be the best one, because you're going to think of Superman. Well, no, you could have done anything. Anything. They should have done Superman. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I don't think a TV show about Superman will do as good as Smallville did. That's true. Because Smallville wasn't about Superman. It was about becoming Superman. Which is different. It's new. Setting nice. up, it's setting up for his son to become Superman. Like he did in the comic. We're not going to get into that though. Since we're talking about the show, TV shows of DC. I love CW. Lois and Clark though. I did too. Yeah. Excuse you. It's um, a little bit cheesy. Well, but... How about Earbart Thon or AKA uh, Zoom? Or not Zoom. Reverse Flash. I actually yeah. liked him a lot. I like him it, a lot as a character. Is it Reverse too. Flash now known as Zoom? No. I don't think so. No, those are two different speedsters. Characters. My favorite res- Reverse uh, Flash has to be the... Um, what's? It's one of the Suicide Squad movies, one of the animated ones. I know what you're talking about. It's the one where he got shot in the head, and he's like, I just move so fast that I don't die. Oh, yeah, because oh really, like, he reveals to Constancy and he goes, "How are you not dead, mate?" And he just reels back and said, "Oh, Batman shot me in the head like three years ago. I just slowed time around me so I don't die." Oh yeah, he's like, "I vibrate so fast, I just don't die. It's just really slow." I oh, think that really? Was the, um, it was that um back from hell or something like that. No, I just watched this a couple weeks ago too. Why That's can't so I think of the name? Uh... Time slowing down. Couldn't he just get somebody to like pull the pay. out? Hell to no, pay. no, no. He shot straight through his. Batman put a bullet straight through his head. Yeah. So it through. was the Batman from Flashpoint Paradox, which was actually um, Batman's dad that became Batman with guns. Uh-huh. His mom became Joker in that paradox as well. Yes, that was mm-hmm. one of my favorites. That was an awesome thing to see. Because their yeah, son like died that. instead of the parents dying. So uh, Yeah, so mom goes crazy. Dad goes, I'm going to go shoot everybody now. Okay. Just like I wish. Just, it's the Batman we want to see. Batman it's the Batman done. we need. Exactly. Especially in nowadays. But we're not going to get into that. We don't have time for that. No. So, what about, what would you classify Constantine as? Would he be a villain? Would he be a hero? If anything, he's, he's a an asshole. Anti- 
He is an asshole. That's if what you classify wrong. John Constantine as. So, if you two are not familiar with John Constantine, he is immortal because he sold his soul to five different demons who don't want to cash in on it because then they'd be taking it away from the other demons, causing a huge war and, and resulting in all their deaths. My so, they most, just kind of let him live. That is my favorite DC character ever. Okay, Constantine so that, is the best. That makes more sense because um, Drew had me watch one of the Dark Justice League animated movies the other day, and I wasn't quite sure what was going on because like he was playing poker or something with yeah. the five demons, and I was I'm like, yep. I know this has something to do with his character, but I didn't know the actual backstory. So that makes um, more sense. And he's able to do that because he has probably one of the most potent powers. I like to think because I just love this character so much. He has a silver tongue that can get him out of any situation. He's a charming, I mean cynical any. asshole. He can he can sell the devil fire. He he can sell you what you don't need and make you feel like you're you like it's the best thing. He, he is the well. The beautiful thing about him is, is the whole reason he's the way he is is because he doesn't want to go to hell. Because he's a devout, um, what was he raised? He was raised Catholic. Mm -hmm. I got news for him. (laughs) So the only reason he's made it this far is because he's like, well, I really don't want to go to hell. So what can I do not to do that? Oh, let me just cause as much chaos as possible. I'm going to trick these five minor demons into giving me eternal life by cheating them in a card game. Hmm. Amazing, amazing character. I, I wish. I, I kind of want... Now, this is probably forbidden of me to say. I want to see Keanu Reeves come back for a remake <coughs> of Constantine live action. I liked that Constantine movie. I'm not going to lie. It was enjoyable okay. for what it was. I, I enjoyed it too, and I'm not sure how the community views that movie, but I liked it. And I'd love to, as they're revisiting The Matrix and they're coming up with a new one of those, I'd love to see a new Constantine movie come out. I just want to see the next Bill and Ted come out if we're on the topic of Keanu Reeves. I'm just saying. <laughs> well, they kind of put that to rest with the last one that came out. I haven't even seen that one yet. And that's what disappoints me. It's really good. I highly recommend it. Hmm. Well, that went off on a tangent. Anyhow. <laughs> yeah, that went really far. That's all right. Yeah, it works. Um, Lucifer Morningstar. A kid. Constantine's bitch. I have a cat named Lucifer of that count. <laughs> of course, that's why your mother named her Lucifer. Oh, no, she didn't name her. That was me and Delaney, and we just told her oh, we'd I... call her Lucy for short. Oh, I thought she was the one who named her that because she was no. such a little demon when she was little. No, she's a sweetheart, though she did bite my hand the other day when I stopped petting her. Yeah. She was very upset. By her. I did not tell you to stop. Exactly. Um, Dylan, did you have... I heard you say you were writing some stuff down. Did you have any villain, like, honorable mentions, or... No. Uh, I gotta find my notes again. To go. Modoc's a good one. Very fun villain that I liked a lot was um was from a video game it was from Dark Souls. Not necessarily a villain so much as a boss. Don't know if we count those as villains mm-hmm. per se, but it's from Dark Souls One. It is the Great Grey Wolf Sif fight. Hmm. It is basically a giant ass wolf that is protecting its master's grave because you're trying to take something from it. Oh, I love that boss. Very sad. Saddest boss fight I've ever been in in a very long time. Because as the fight goes on, the wolf gets weaker and weaker and weaker. You can see it limping around and whining. And it just makes you feel so bad the entire time you are fighting it. And it's one of the few bosses in that game you actually feel bad about beating. Then again, it is Dark Souls, so... It's Dark Souls, so most of them are ugly as hell things and there's a doggo but another one i had thought of and this will probably make 
the two old people here happy would be Riku okay. from the first Kingdom Hearts. Okay. I have never played Kingdom Hearts, so I cannot help with this conversation. I did not play a lot of Kingdom Hearts. I only know of it because of Drew and Lizette. <laughs> In all honesty, the only one I've ever beaten is Kingdom Hearts 3 <laughs> and Dream Drop Vistits. <laughs> The only two I've ever beat, but Riku from the first one was always one of my favorite villains into anti-hero into a protagonist. Yeah, because in the first game, technically, it's not actually him that's being mm -hmm. the villain. He's been possessed. So. It, exactly. The whole start of him is he got separated from Sora when they went through the door and the Heartless attacked the island first. Mm -hmm. And he... Ended up on the short end of the stick. He was surrounded by villains. He sees Sora go off with two new friends without a care in the world after having been his friend for so long. He's just a hurt child that yeah. tried to take on way too much, try to change way too much and make a better thing for his friends, his family, basically, that he chose only to feel like he's been left behind. That was always something that stuck with me was that whole abandonment and being left behind and that just feeling you get from it. Yeah. And it shows how a person can change depending on who they are with. Sora became a better person because he was hanging with better people. Mm -hmm. Riku became a worse person because he got stuck with the worst people. Mm -hmm. Ironically, Who manipulated the... him and controlled him. Ironically, That's the main one of that was Maleficent. Exactly. Mm -hmm. so That's what made me think of Riku when you were going on about Maleficent. I was like, we've come full circle. <laughs> He's a fantastic character. We'd get there someday. It'd be a circle, a square, a pentagram. Who knows? We're going to connect the dots. <laughs> <laughs> but I always liked Riku's story better than Sora's. I, I have to agree with you on that. I, I did as well. Riku's always felt like more like a real character that developed and changed. Mm -hmm. And that might have been because I always saw him as the older character, the slightly cooler character. Why Sora was like that younger brother or sibling, always complaining and whining. But then he was just too happy sometimes. Yeah. Just way too happy and positive. Which I get for a kid's thing. Mm -hmm. But Riku always went from positive to sad to cynical to he's just he's just frank. He's plain. He says what needs to be said. Yeah, where in the, that. yeah, and you definitely see his character develop across all of the games. Whereas Sora is still very much the same, very close to the same character we started out with. He he's had character development, but not not in the same way. Mm -hmm. It's not until you hit Dream Drop Distance in Kingdom Hearts Three that Sora actually gets forced to develop in the story itself. Yeah. Compared to Riku, who from the very first moment you meet him before you start that game, you can see him changing. You yeah. can see him going from that arrogant boy into that sad, broken boy into someone who's forged himself into a confident and vital character to the story. Yeah. Always enjoyed that. One of my favorite parts about that whole game series. I yeah. agree. It's kind of interesting, too, if you dig deeper into that game series, how um, um, when you get into Birth by Sleep and you see which of those three characters, how they um, how they picked who. So you have Tara, Aqua and Ben, how they kind of each picked who their successor would be. Yes. And Tara picked Riku and their stories do parallel very closely. Um, Ven, Ven didn't pick Sora, the, that, that whole story is too complicated to explain at 11.30 at night. That's um, all it is, I'm actually kind of wide awake. <laughs> well, I'm starting to fall asleep, the cough medicine and all of the other drugs I've had to take. My drugs to... are bad, kids. <laughs> I, I've Not sponsored by Dare. <laughs> <laughs> drugs are only bad if you take too many. Uh, um, but then I think Aqua, she didn't pick Kyrie as her successor, but she kind of like, she ran into her and they kind of influenced each other. I, I agree with you. I feel like Riku was the only one that was truly chosen. 
Yes. And that's because and... both him and Tara were the most mature and kind of, I want to say, the protectors of their personal groups. Yeah. The ones they... to bear it all on their shoulders and mm. push through it. And I think that's also part of why the two of them were drawn a little bit more to the dark. Because it's like, if this will give me the power to protect the ones I love, I'll deal with it. Exactly. There was the whole point in one of the games where we thought Riku had gone back to the dark, but he was only pretending. Oh, yeah, that was in bear, two. To, to bear more of the blunt damage from everything and protect Sora and Kairi even longer. Yeah. And another thing that's interesting, I, you probably already know this, but um, Sora, <coughs> Sora, the Keyblade that he got was actually supposed to go to Riku. That was, but because of what happened on Destiny Islands and like the the way the events unfolded, it went to Sora instead. But that was actually like um, supposed to be Terra's. Um, not necessarily his legacy going to Riku, but because he was picked as his successor, that Keyblade belonged, actually belonged to Riku. And it just went to Sora because of how convoluted all of those events happened at the beginning of the first game. Yes. So, and then because of Ven's heart being in Sora and all of that other fun stuff. Again, yeah. I'm not... I'm, all like, the weird plot twists and the little yoo and surprise. Yeah. That, um... The Final Fantasy creators and such are all big fans of. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of Final Fantasy, mm-hmm. Sephiroth. Oh, Sephiroth. Villain. Genesis. Is he also considered a villain? I haven't played too much of Genesis, that one. So Genesis is the villain of Final Fantasy VII Crisis Core, but he definitely in my mind falls under that mantle of anti-hero leaning more towards the villain because he definitely does some horrible things but both him and sethroth were men who discovered their existence for what it truly was Uh and could not handle it as well yeah it wasn't something they were strong enough to handle so they broke in the wrong way the difference is Genesis turned around and was purposely trying to save the planet and kind of fix some of the things that he realized that had been done wrong. He went about it a very violent way, but he he had some good underlying motives. Sephiroth just set a village on fire and killed a bunch of people. It's because Sephiroth is sexy, that's why. This is true. It's the long gray hair. He can get away with it. Yes, because he looks at cloud and zach through the flames and everybody's just like still an iconic moment picture just the energy and the feel from that is like amazing yes i need the second part of the final fantasy 7 remake because Uh, they did something to play the first part (laughs) because they did something at the end of it and it makes me both very upset and very excited because i don't know what they're doing and i need to know because my favorite character Spoilers. I, spoilers. Wait, did I? T- I thought I told you this already. You did. I already know it. Okay. Well, I'm just saying for the podcast so Gordon doesn't get upset. You said something about spoilers and Gordon oh. getting upset. So that's fair. Good job. I'm looking after you, Gordo. I appreciate you, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. uh, but anyway, um, for the Final Fantasy VII remake. They actually built into the story where by the end of the video game, it's no longer a remake. There's, It's actually a parallel universe. The story has diverged. The multiverse leaks into yes. everything. And um, like <laughs> Aerith, Aerith is actually aware of it and she tells Cloud, she's like, we might be able to change what happened. Oh, we man. We can fix it. And she's like, I don't know what's going to happen, but... You see, as you're playing through that remake, you see things diverge from the... If, you, if you're if you familiar with the original story, you see things start to diverge from the original story. And there's these forces that come into play that try to put it back and make you, make you do the way that it's supposed to happen. Uh, and eventually, at the end of the game, you yeah. kind of... You break the whole thing and now well, it's yeah. a completely it's a completely different story. You have made the multiverse happen. Yeah, and it's... <laughs> 
You wonder if it's what? I wonder if that's where Loki got their idea from, question mark? Possibly. Ah. <laughs> okay, okay, I can, okay. I'll play ball. Um, <laughs> I don't like, I don't like connecting my Loki with my other stuff, but okay. Well, um, you know I have a bad habit of making weird connections with things. This is true. Um, but what I was going to say with the, the breaking of the, um, the Final Fantasy VII timeline, it rippled backwards. And it changed stuff in the past, too. And that's what I'm really like. I don't know what they're doing. And I need to, I see. And I need to, I need to know. Because my favorite character's back. And he's not supposed to be back. And I, it, But they also didn't get the right voice actor. And that pissed me off. So that's um, why you put it in Japanese and read subtitles like a baller. Uh, that's probably oh, what I'm going to do. I'm probably going to do that next time around unless this voice actor gets his act together because support American support American voice actor work. They get paid pennies on the dollar. It's horrible. Support American voice okay, work. But, but look, I was in I now. in high school, I was absolutely in love with Zach Fair and he was voiced by Rick Gomez and now he's not and it's not the same, okay? I understand. That's why you subtitles. Exactly. What? So if this we'll never have is... voice actors again getting paid, paid fairly if we all switch over to the subtitles. Well, how are they going to know when it's, it's not like it's, it's live? It's supply and demand, though. If the, okay. all the analytics are showing that people are, like, for animes on Netflix or whatever, people aren't watching the English dub. Oh, and don't even get me started on people that dub because they get paid even less and they're, like, translating another language. Sorry. Yeah, a language that <clears throat> sentence structure is completely different than ours, almost reversed. It's they just that I, we, I will I'll always advocate for voice work. So put your subtitles on and listen to the dub. <laughs> of course, and, and tweet tweet the people like tweet at them and be like, why is it you said it was Rick Gomez? Rick Gomez was who voiced him in Crisis Core. But they, I know, I know why they did it because they completely redid the entire voice cast for the remake. Oh, that's I hate that. Yeah, and they, some of them are really good. Some of them are like really close to the original actors, and then some of them are distinctly different. But I'm like, you know what? I can work with it. The one that they got for Zach, when he like he sounded kind of close when he first started talking. And then the next scene that he's in, his voice is really nasally. And that's not that's not Zach's voice. And I was just like, oh no. But then like the scene after that, it was kind of okay. So I'm like, I am willing to give him a chance. But Hannah and I spent mm, far too much time analyzing all of Crisis Core and fawning over him. Far too much time far too much time um that was our favorite character i have a giant poster of him and era standing back to back i am planning potentially a final fantasy 7 tattoo that would be him and Aerith because they're my favorite fictional couple ever mm -hmm. she along with cloud tifa belongs with cloud and drew can fight me over it um Drew has terrible taste when it comes to things like that. Anyhow, yeah. Just anyway, <laughs> <coughs> so anyway, um, but yes, yeah, Sephiroth is an awesome villain. From that, um, he makes his way into Kingdom Hearts, and he's pretty entertaining over there as well. But he's more of a, like he's an optional boss, so not as big in the storyline as some of the others. Um, I don't know. I'm, if I'm sorry. Give me one second. I'm DMing Rick Gomez. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we uh, we are all. So I, I found out that there's an unreleased Fantastic Four movie. Hopefully, it's unreleased for a good forever. <laughs> um, fun fact: Rick Gomez was apparently in the first Transformers movie. Oh, I know. Hannah and I found that out. Like when again when we were in high school. Wait, the sheriff. Yes. If you go back and you watch that scene and you like 
were as obsessed with crisis core as we were we went back and we watched that scene like four times in a row and we're trying to like pick out his zach voice versus his acting voice yeah so yes i i did i knew that i just i just looked up everything <laughs> he was like, in. i'm like oh he was in I the know. burn notice too that's fun hawaii 5 i know these things i mean Hey, I shot my shot, and I said my cousin and I have a podcast. She's a fan of your voice work, specifically your role as Zach Fair. Would you? We would love to interview you. But like Bob said, you just got to reach out to these people. And, and like, what did he say yes. when they went up to the Walking Dead panels? You just got to like talk about something that they did that was not the reason that they're there, and uh-huh. they, they realize that you're a fan of their work. <laughs> so we'll see. Maybe we'll have Rick Gomez on the podcast. I mean. Speaking of that, he was in one of my favorite movies, the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. He played a thug. No way. That's not like where you got to start. That's like a background. That'd be really cool. Yeah, 1990. That was his first thing, and he was uncredited in it. I'm going to just send him this episode. Like, listen, like, join it at this time. Oh, that is literally his first role. Wow. Wait. And he was in Clerks. Is this a um, Zach Fair Stan podcast now? <laughs> he was. Oh, Zach! Zach is one of my favorite characters. Just yeah. his I'm whole... sorry, Rick Gomez. I said Zach, but you know what I meant. Yeah, we, that's who he is to some people here. We know. It's, yeah. So apparently, he was also in the opening song for My Gym Partner's a Monkey. If anyone remembers that TV show, oh, that show is iconic. It's hilarious. <laughs> all right, we got to get old, Mr. Gomez on the show. Oh my goodness, I would cry if he agreed to come on here. He's, I would be He is in the TV re- reboot of my favorite nineties cop show. Holy crap. Dude, is he like this is <laughs> this is just him? We're, okay, we gotta get off of this, but my favorite cop <laughs> drama from the nineties was called NYPD Blue. Yeah. And they've been talking about rebooting it and he's listed on it as um, like in his upcoming projects. Ooh. Dude, that'd be awesome. All right. Anyway, we got we we are running over, and we are off the rails as per <laughs> usual. Does anybody have any parting words before I do our quick little outro? Oh, I was just happy to be here, and I appreciate the invite, and I'm glad I finally got a chance. Well, we were yeah. happy to have you. I think I speak for everyone when I say we definitely want to have you back. It was a very good episode. Yeah. I definitely love to be back. Awesome. Gordon. You gotta make your sister get on next mm-hmm. time. Yeah. I'll just Anything. record her when she's not paying attention. Just don't tell her we're rolling. That works. <laughs> That's her problem. So, uh, yeah, we'll go with that. <laughs> um, Gordo, anything for the... Uh, any final words for the episode? Um, I zoned out for the last half be- of that because I had no clue what any of you were talking about. <laughs> old, old people stuff. I'll throw myself in there with the old people. They call me an old man at work. <laughs> Well, Gordon, you should have just pulled up a Wikipedia page about it. Anyway, so with that being said, I want to thank you all for listening. This has been another episode of Let's Be Nerds. We want to thank our guest host, Dylan, for joining us. We definitely want to have him back in the future. If you like today's episode, please leave us a rate and review on whatever platform you get your podcasts. If you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. Uh, leave us comments and reviews. Tell us what you like and what you don't like. Tell us your favorite villain. We love to hear from you. The Discord link will be in the description box below. Please come join us. We have a lot of fun over there. Uh, we're really trying to build a community here where we just show that, you know, the term nerd is we're taking the power back. You can really be a nerd about anything. And we just want to have a little bit of fun along the way. With that being said, I also want to thank Anchor for sponsoring us. Without them, this podcast would not be possible. And we'll see you guys in the next one. Let's Be Nerds is hosted and executive produced by Gordon Bryant and me, Stephen J. McLean. Let's Be Nerds is a production of Speakeasy Productions. Our social media manager is Kylie Gregg. Our managing producer and co-host is Lizette Ayala. To keep up with the latest on Let's Be Nerds, join our Discord server linked in the description box below. Follow us on Instagram at Let's Be Nerds Pod or find us on Twitter at Let's the Letter B Nerds.